So hello everyone and welcome to Inclusivity, a vlog um, hosted by William James College that covers topics of diversity, equity, inclusion, and in the mental and behavioral health fields. We have three guests today, um, Dr. Sukanya Ray, Dr. Catherine Vuki, and Dr. Douglas Ish Ishi, and we will be talking about um, combating xenophobia during COVID-19. So I'm gonna start by um, introducing our guest. So Dr. Vuki is an assistant professor at William James College. Uh, she's also the director of the Asian Mental Health Program. She's a clinical supervisor at South Co Cove Community Health Center. And outside of work, she has three cats, a 16-year-old female and two-year-old male brothers that keep her very busy and active at home. Dr. Ray, Sukanya Ray, is an associate professor in psychology at Suffolk University. She's trained and worked in India, Australia, and the United States. She's taught undergraduate courses at various universities and is a community consultant, researcher, and educator in multicultural issues, women's body image eating problems, Asian mental health disparities, and alternative healing practices, trauma and resiliency and immigrant adjustment patterns. She's also the co-chair of the Committee on Ethnic Minority Affairs of Massachusetts Psychology Association. Uh, Douglas Ishii is an assistant professor of Asian diasporic literature in the De Department of Writing, Literature and Publishing at Emerson College. He teaches courses on US multi-ethnic literature and art, Asian American history and culture, and transnational Asian American studies. He received his PhD from the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland College Park and previously held positions at the University of Colorado and Northwestern University. Outside of his life on campus, Doug's hobbies include intramural basketball, uh, dodgeball, con contemporary dance, and jogging along the Charles. All right, I'll go ahead and stop share and welcome everybody. But our topic today, specifically combating xenophobia during COVID-19, will uh, cover a lot of areas talking about the news, um, thinking about our stories um, with interacting with xenophobia during COVID, and we'll move to talk about some strategies on how to combat um, these moments and situations. So I'd like to welcome you again. Our, uh, we'll get right to it. The first question um, is really um, allowing us to think about how we define xenophobia, especially during this time. Um, what does xenophobia look like in this time of social distancing? Catherine, I'd like to begin with you. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you, Gloria. Thank you very much for inviting me part of this panel. Um, so, um, just having thought about the questions and all that, so I wanted to start with the definition of xenophobia. So, according to the Merriam Webster Dictionary, xenophobia is defined as an irrational fear of foreigners or of anything foreign. So an example of someone with xenophobia is a person who is fearful or hateful of recent immigrants, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and in light of everything that's happening on, happening right now with the pandemic, with the COVID-19, xenophobia in this instance would be the fearful of uh, Asians, Asian Americans, um, and that's why we're here to talk about it. I wanted um, actually to quote um, the uh, WHO Director General on March 2nd, in 2020, he actually said, because when he was talking about the virus, he said, stigma, to be honest, is more dangerous than the virus itself. And as we know, stigma in the communities of all ethnic communities has been very harmful, and I think even more so now. So uh, we're talking about xenophobia, stigma. Um, yeah, for, for, yeah. So Doug and um, Takanya, if any uh, additional comments to, uh, the first question, please feel free to just jump in at any point. If not, we'll move on. The spread of this racist rhetoric that is paralleled with and it's going side by side with all the racist attacks. Um, we, we focus a little bit about on misinformation and disinformation uh, sometimes that inflames these divides. 
we've seen in the news uh, from the start of shelter in place to I mean, even early as February, uh, beatings, violent bullying, racist abuse. Um, so I'd like us to think about how um, uh, language, the, the, the dialogue and the rhetoric that goes along with um, these increase of attacks. And, and Doug, I'd like to um, give this question to you. Yes, so this builds upon what Professor Vuki has talked about in terms of xenophobia, because if we think about the role of misinformation and disinformation and inflammatory rhetoric, we're thinking about how older modes of racism have merged with xenophobia as a way of explaining through uh, incorrect information what's going on around us. So as we're talking about personal stories, my personal story of the pandemic is that one day I was walking down the street wearing a mask when a white man began to shout at me and when I didn't respond, turned around and chased me down the street screaming, go back to where the fuck you came from. This is not new and this is not exceptional because if we think about the murder of Vincent Chin, this took place on June 19th, 1982. Vincent Chin was a Chinese American man and this is in 1982 during the downturn of the Detroit auto industry. He was murdered by multiple contusions to the head with a baseball bat by Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz. Michael Nitz used to be employed by that Detroit auto industry. And according to witnesses, the, this was an escalation of a fight that began when Ronald Evans said, it's because of you little motherfuckers that were out of jobs. So notice here that there is this kind of flattening going on in which global events become explained through these individualized racist caricatures. And why is this taking place in Detroit in 1982? It's because, not because of the way that it was explained in the media about the Japanese taking over, it was because of policies being passed in order to benefit certain corporations and maximize profits that took the form of racist rhetoric. So here we see between 1982 and 2020, the use of racist rhetoric and misinformation to blame entire communities of people instead of actually explain the larger global situation that's happening. However, a focus too much on individuals loses that the initial charge was that both Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz were found guilty of manslaughter, which was to be bargained to second degree murder. And the consequences were that they were fined $3,000 and three years of probation with no jail time. So it's not just about individuals, it's also about failing institutions that are also explained away. Because in giving this sentence, the judge said that these are good men who don't deserve to be punished. So here we see this clearly racist act happening through this second level implicit bias that has racist effects that are explained away as though racism is not there. So those are those combined processes of on the one hand, global events becoming explained through racist misinformation, as well as institutions failing to serve the people. If we think about the imagery that was used to explain the Japanese cars, it's the same sort of yellow peril rhetoric that led to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a century earlier, in which there are too many foreign invaders taking over US shores. So we see how there's this longer history to this racist rhetoric. But also, if we're talking about COVID-19, we also have to talk about the disproportionate material effect that it's had on Black and Latinx communities, both in Boston and across the nation because as we're talking about these individual acts of extreme violence and prejudice against raced Asian people, we also have to talk about the fact that we're not talking about who's being unevenly impacted. A class analysis alone can't explain that when we look at the breakdown by zip codes of confirmed cases of COVID-19, that those that rank the highest are those zip codes that we immediately recognize as predominantly Black and African American and Latinx neighborhoods, and those that are the least impacted with the fewest confirmed cases are those that we know to be class exclusive, racially segregated neighborhoods. So we have to think about these dual impacts. And as we think about the recent protests for justice against police brutality in the murder of George Floyd, one of the demands made by the movement for black lives 
is a reinvestment in Black communities for the protection against COVID-19. Because on the one hand, racism takes the form of merging with xenophobia as misinformation that blames Asians for what's happening. On the other hand, it's also this marked silence about the fact that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting Black and Latinx communities in this silent, low death. Misinformation makes sure that we don't see all these connections. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Doug. Yes, I think what you, um, it's very, uh, when we came together to think and, and brainstorm on this um, topic for the blog and, and addressing the issue at the time that was so prevalent, um, was only a month ago. And today we are sitting here um, in the first week of June and so much has happened in our country um, that is, that, you know, racism has fueled. And so what, you know, the, the feelings of xenophobia, the feelings of, of um, the other um, have become so charged and intertwined uh, with, so many marginalized communities, um, and in this moment in time, the Black community. Uh, when we think about um, identities and uh, what people are um, uh, sort of attaching to a physical, visual image of someone, um, it's very, um, it's very powerful to be able to to uh, say to your community that, um, especially for marginalized communities um, or oppressed communities, uh, to stand together. Um, but at the beginning of this virus breaking out, uh, this pandemic beginning, there is a, a want, a need sometimes to turn to your own, to think about you know, who is in your bubble? If we're gonna shelter in place, who is the, the close-knit community that um, we belong to? So thinking a little bit about um, identities and what's happening within our uh, Asian population, um, I'd like, uh, Sukanya, if you could talk a little bit about um, some of those dynamics and some of those uh, relationships, and, and, and um, uh, especially during this time. Thank you, Gloria. I think um, Kathy and Doc, you explained very well. I will just piggyback on a couple of things uh, relating to xenophobia and uh, the so-called Chinese virus. Now this rhetoric is very dangerous for, from true perspective. Uh, from my uh, vantage point, I'm a South Asian um, and I'm seeing a couple of things, and I'll start with the, the literature on trauma. When trauma happens, whether it is disease, racism, doesn't matter, people have re responses which are very complex. Either they fight or they flee. Sometimes people try to scapegoat so that they will feel a little more uh, safe uh, and detach. And I think that's very dangerous because in the last semester, uh, in March, when I was uh, teaching psychology of trauma, it was very difficult for me to teach and not include this domain. Um, partly because many students also felt um, kind of separated, marginalized, rejected. And to me, that also happened not just across community, uh, people of color and whites, but it was sad to see how this can play out as internalized racism. What that is, that when we have some kind of racial experience, it divides even within minority communities. And that I have witnessed, I have worked, and a lot of sharing students have done. At that point of time, even as a South Asian member of the community, I was horrified to know that some of the South Asian community members, including students and others, tried to detach themselves or separate themselves as a different identity from other Asians. We are not Chinese, 
we are not Asians, we are safe. And that really created very difficult time, at least from my point of view, is like, what are we doing? I mean, it is, it is pandemic, it's for all of us, but this divisive mentality, which is not new in this country, we always have seen that. And for me, I always say it's kind of a colonial mentality. Uh, and I have a lot of dialogue with my own community that this is not a time to divide again, that we are South Asian, we are not part of the problem, even though that is misinformation, uh, but students, and I don't want to kind of take all the time, but that was very sad for me. And the second thing I think, uh, 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 Doug and Dr. Bhuki, you both mentioned is that um, this is a stressful time. However, this is not new. It has a history. It just triggered what has been existing. And I would just say that after George Floyd's death, horrific death, it's becoming a nationwide, I would say worldwide phenomena. It's not just for one person, it's historical oppression and minimization is speaking. So at this point, I'll just stop and go for the next. Thank you very much, Satanya. I think that. Uh, oh, Gloria, oh, Lord, could I, if I could ask something to what Sakonia was saying about this internalized racism. Um, so again, I think we've had conversations about <clears throat> students and how the, each of the Asian um, groups would, uh, would distance themselves because, and I remember even from the stars, each one n one you know student they're like that was chinese like i'm japanese or i'm my i'm vietnamese i'm not like them um but in particular with this COVID 19 you know in my clinic work i had a 16 year old uh, young uh, girl who came in she came in very upset and she said that in her history class the professor or the teacher did bring up this pen this COVID 19 and to talk about it um and so she was really upset because she was doing her due diligence and, re and reading up on it. And she was so angry saying that people are so ignorant. They're just, they, you know, that, at that point, they're like, um, the Chinese are so dirty. They're like animals. They eat other animals. They just, they're just awful things are being said. And uh, the, per the teacher did not challenge that misinformation. It was just fact. And that's what they believe. And so for her process, she actually spoke up and said, do you know if this is true? She challenged her classmates. However, in the second, what was happening for her was that she's Chinese Vietnamese. And so she, then she turned to me and she goes, you know, I wish the Chinese would just stop doing this. It just gives us a bad name. So even for her, she's Vietnamese Chinese, but at that moment, she didn't want to be that Chinese part of her. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just, we had a, a, an enriching talk about identity and um, for her, she firmly identifies as Asian, so that was her protective factor, and, but she was just, I'm going to speak up every time, but however, she was disheartened to see that how many of her peers believe what was going on in the media, and the, and the teacher did not step up. So you're, you know, not only with all the different groups, right, Asian groups, distancing themselves, but even internally, what are these, what are people um, feeling? So I think that is something that we need to recognize and support, um, and we're not doing enough as teachers, as professionals ever to step up and talk about the internalized racism as well. Yeah, thanks, Kathy and, and Sukarnia. Um, it, it's when you, um, and these are uh, students or um, uh, young adults or, or adults in different developmental stages and, and you see how um, the media the the news the the language around it the information period that is um consumed can be so powerful to move somebody to you know turn inward and dislike themselves for multiple areas of the identity um or close up, close themselves off um i think that the um, the stories that you you're sharing of of people um, trying to unpack that is is ongoing. Uh, we we feel it in ourselves, and you know, as as educators, we're seeing it with our students. 
Um, and it's important sometimes to think about uh, where, yes, for mental health professionals, pe people are turning to them, but where do people turn um, for those, those resources? There have been many, many um, Asian American organizations that have come together, uh, whether it is to collect the data, whether it is to support, whether it is to just open their doors um, as much as possible to be that sort of advocacy for all. But, you know, when we think about um, the, um, the physical harm or the the emotional harm that uh, folks are going through it it sometimes leaves you in a space where what what can i do um, and so i'd like us to talk a little bit about maybe your knowledge of or interactions with uh, some uh, coalitions or groups or organized efforts uh, on how we're responding to trying to think of how to fight this? How do we fight the hate? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so when we were talking about this, I have to say, when this began, it did feel very isolating, scary, in fact, for many, not only as uh, for our patients or my clients, my students, but for myself as well. And by, I have seen so many groups and organizations come forward. And, you know, the, the stereotype is, oh, patients are very quiet. They don't stir up the pot. They just, you know, we don't gather. We don't do anything. We're not advocates. I have to say, this has been an amazing time for the Asian American groups. You see in the media where groups are coming together and speaking up, right? Um, and so I was, I was uh, really just privileged to join this town hall that was put online. Um, it was on anti-racism and xenophobia pretty early on. 3,000 participants signed on. That is amazing. And they all, there are a lot of panelists talking about the anti-racism, xenophobia, and what is our, where is our voice? How can we gather? And so that was just like the first one. And then, um, so that's like nationally, but even more locally, you know, you can find um, like, um, MGH has a, well, a social wellness program. They do, they connect with Harvard's Let's Talk educational program. And so they're putting on a lot of webinars about helping parents how to parent. They had a, a group for international students. There are a lot of support groups for coming online. And so if you Google it, look at, they're there. Even at William James College, you know, put together a uh, Asian um, counseling networking support group. We know that 44% of Asian Americans, because this has started out in December, we've been on the front lines as counselors helping our community. And there's a high rate of anxiety and depression, and we don't have anyone to turn to. So we at William James wanted to support our Asian counselors as well. There are groups popping up, and it is tremendous right now. People are speaking up and saying, we need help and we want to help. Um, I think was looking at another group too. Um, Asian Women for Health has been a long-standing network in Boston. They're actually uh, cancer survivors. And so they're always putting support groups together, but then they target specifically support groups for COVID-19 or for allyship. So their people are out there, we're out there. And I think if uh, you ask um, and that there's someone there for us to, to, uh, to turn to. So I'm very proud of that. It's like, we are stepping up. And I don't know if there were other groups at other networks as well, but I see that popping up in um, in, in all disciplines, you know. So of course, in our in a, the mental health field, we're, we're we're seeing a tremendous response. I'm seeing the humanities um, folks just coming together and responding. Earlier on, Penn uh, produced a, a webinar and brought uh, uh, folks to talk about uh, xenophobia. Um, any other? Um, uh, interactions with organized um, groups? Um, I can just say that uh, Dr. Hookey initiated uh, two beautiful um, online support, one for professional, another for students, and that was really remarkable. Um, I attended a um, couple of times. And with uh, from my end, I just called on another South Asian group in Massachusetts after I witnessed an incident, which I'll share in a minute. Um, I called on the board uh, members and asked 
them to have a network event just to address and dialogue about inter-ethnic tension. Saheli is the group. And, uh, and it was really well attended, not just uh, within uh, Massachusetts, there were members from uh, other states who really want to be allies. Um, and we had a kind of discussion. Um, it got triggered by me witnessing, and it was not a very nice thing to witness, but I did. There was a, a South Asian, I won't name it, and South Asian um, store where the, the owner was trying to implement the six feet distance rule, social distancing. And um, there was another South Asian lady who said, why are you telling me? You should tell her, her meaning another Chinese um, kind of customer there. And she was horrified. And a couple of us said, you know, we are maintaining social distance uh, irrespective of our background, but the South Asian lady kept on arguing with the owner saying, it's the virus they brought us, we didn't. And at that point, it was really very um, troublesome, but what I really appreciated, there was a white male customer came forward and stopped her saying, stop this divisive nature, it's pandemic don't do that and that was really you know at some point i felt despair and horrible seeing this interethnic but then the allyship which is at the individual level and that really made me realize to call on the south asian network like can we just dialogue and it was really very fulfilling for me for my soul um being in the profession we are educators we are healthcare providers we also have to do something both at a professional level and personal level and then to just jump in i want to think about four interconnected things that have been really inspirational to me over the course of sheltering in place so as we've all mentioned we're living in this moment where the constant failure of institutions and systems of governance is becoming more and more clear and we're experiencing the individualized trauma of that fallout. So one way of thinking about this sort of systemic failure that I found really inspirational is the Auntie Sewing Squad. So many people have taken to their sewing machine to prepare personal protective equipment in light of the kind of failure for our government to do that for us. This group of predominantly Asian American women, but also all people are welcome, has organized to coordinate the collection of these homemade masks and make sure that they're sent out to particularly vulnerable communities. So that sort of doing something with this nervous energy has been something really wonderful. The shirt that I'm wearing, Solidarity by Any Means Necessary, is from an organization called Vigilant Love that was founded in 2017, initially to think about the linkages between the historic oppression of Asian Americans and the rising tide of Islamophobia, but then also has worked to build bridges across different ethnic and racial communities. And that's the type of thing that can deal with this moment of misinformation and isolation. So I'd love to see more of that going on. Related to thinking about the linkages between our communities and our identities, as Gloria has alluded to, there have been many people from all different parts of the educational sector turning online to build community in moments such that social isolation doesn't have to become a moment of anxiety paranoia and misinformation. What I found really useful is the Intersectionality Matters podcast headed by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw at the University of California, Los Angeles, has hosted a series of webinars under the special series Under the Black Light that has drawn attention to the racial and intersectional impact of COVID-19 that has not been discussed. So even though it's hosted by the African American Policy Forum, there are so many analyses and so many speakers who link what's happening with Asian and Asian Americans as racial scapegoats to the larger systemic failure that is causing the disproportionate impact and death in Black and African American communities. So just building across these lines, the fourth organization, especially in light of recent events, is just being plugged into the movement for Black lives and thinking about how the pandemic, on the one hand, is a virus, and on the other hand, 
racism is the pandemic. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, it um, the the efforts I think of 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 our individual efforts are you know when we start widening the circle, our family, our group, our community, um, we're organized uh, with the with policy and institutions and and uh the our voice at the end of the day is what is going to be the most powerful um when we think of um uh just globally what's happening even in um on may 8th um the united nations secretary general Antio antonio Guterres said that the pandemic continues to leash a tsunami of hate and xenophobia, scapegoating, we've been talking about, and scaremongering. And he's urging from a top-down level um, governments to act to strengthen the immunity of our societies against the virus of hate. And it's it, it, this sort of um, voice and this top-down uh, leadership has to happen uh, because we know and we're aware of the grassroots. We know of the community building, but it really needs to go both ways. Um, but in a moment, in a moment, sometimes you are left solo. You are left by yourself. And we have, um, I know some of you have prepared some information on slides that can point to um, the incidents that have happened. Uh, but in those individual moments where I might be confronted, what do I do? How do I, how do I respond? How do I, you know, Doug, you shared uh, your story where, you know, you, you, you chose to ignore um, and that person still pursued you. Um, that's that's scary that you, you're fearful and and you're thinking for your life at that moment. Um, and so I'd like to just spend some time talking about what are some so some strategies. And if you want me to pull up any of the information that you want on your slides, just let me know and I'll and I'll share the screen. Yes, Gloria, if you could pull up the one um, with like interrupting bias and stereotypic comments, I think that is the perfect slide for this. Right, so this is, again, as you see, it says adapted from, from um, Diane Goodman, um, promoting diversity and social justice, educating people from privileged group. And this is what I use to help my the students or um, people that I see and talk about, like you said, Gloria, what, what can we do in that moment when we're faced with a, a remark or something? I mean, it could be subtle, not so subtle in your face. So, um, so some possible responses would be, you know, paraphrasing, repeat back, um, or saying, excuse me, what did you say? Um, some people say adding a little humor to it or just being curious, asking, so not reacting right away from an angry response because when we are angry, people respond to that anger, not necessarily to what they just said, which was, very, which was a racist comment. So really taking the time to be curious, why did you say that? Or perhaps saying, if someone said that to you, how would you feel? And again, always safety first you know you don't you want to make sure assess that you're okay especially if you're alone if this is a conversation to have or what doug did was many people just walk away um but these are again some of the some of the possible responses and i actually wanted to share a couple of uh scenarios that i've heard from people and so actually one of my colleagues recently was um in a, a retail store and she she's asian and her boyfriend is white and so the um, the boyfriend had left a cart, the shopping cart, in the middle of the aisle. And so then my colleague went up just to try to, you know, get it out of people's way. And a white woman came up behind her and just said, looked at her and said Chinese, and then walked away. And so my colleague was really angry and just said, what did you just say? And then the woman said, I didn't say anything. And when she walked away again, said Chinese, under her breath again. And so her partner heard that and then Ashley went up to the woman and said, excuse me, what you said was inappropriate. So he dialogued with her. She was very defensive. I didn't say it, I didn't say it, but he kept going saying, I heard you and it's not okay. Ashley, that was my car and it's still not okay that you said that. So one way is like having, like 
uh, allyship, having someone else speak up, right? And so again, it was a support, but it was not letting people get away with this, right? You have to address it, again, if you can. I wanna share another story. Uh, my, someone else said that she was in a grocery store and um, she, actually she was in her car and uh, a, a white woman uh, was parked next to her, rolled down her window and just started saying something like, it's because of you that we have to wear a mask and that we don't have, I forget all the stuff, but she goes, it's because of you we, and we don't have a mask or we have to wear a mask. And so this person could have swore her or whatever and done nothing, but she decided to dialogue. She goes, excuse me, why are you saying that? And then the, the person started to talk about the, um, you know, what happened at the onset of the pandemic. She said, actually for us Asians, we always, we started wearing a mask. We, we, we isolate ourselves. We did everything we need to do to not spread the virus, right? So she, and so they had this dialogue for a good 15, 20 minutes. And in the end, the white woman, the customer actually apologized and said, you know what? I actually didn't think of that way. And she mm -hmm. apologized. So I think one of those heartwarming experiences, like, wow, that turned out well, and there was a piece of education to it. So these are just two examples. Others have not gone so well, where they were chased, had to be run away, and then left with all these feelings of anger and resentment. So I think it's, um, I think it's educating ourselves, what can we do in the moment, um, but also having other people support you and have your back. So if you see something and it's not okay, speak up for that person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, Gloria, I'll just jump in at this point if it's okay. Uh, I was teaching a class and uh, I couldn't escape because it was psychology of trauma. And there was an international student who um, said that her roommate moved, moved um, away, just ended the contract with her saying that I can't stay with a Chinese student. And she was devastated and was very upset. And the same day in the newspaper, if you know that the two, uh, one was an anesthesiology, I think in the slide, I put that all, the two uh, healthcare providers were chased, harassed um, by folks, even though they serve um, as a healthcare provider working with a COVID-19 uh, patient. So we were discussing that in the class. And, you know, the young, um, folks, I my heart goes out to the younger generation, how empathic and um, how much they really feel. So the student who is such a young, and with her permission, I gave you the thank you card. She said that this is not okay. We are 2020. We are the generation have to stop. Can we do something? And she mobilized the whole class to make a thank you card pro project. It was for everybody, but it was triggered by this incident um, uh, reported by MGH provider. And she's such a, she's a Caucasian, young, 20 years old, not 20, 19 years old student who said, this is not okay. Can we do something to send the card? Thank you to these providers. And in fact, she sent me this without me saying anything. She mobilized the class, sent me this, and I have sent that to a couple of my network to show that allyship is for everybody. We all have to stand in support and solidarity when there is racism. It's not just for us during COVID-19, oppression. Oppression means, as uh, Kathy said, some time you have to speak up. And this young person really amazed me by having this creative way to acknowledge the contribution and mobilizing the class to do something as a project. So she gave me some insight going forward, how as an educator, these are teaching moments for me even to do something. Thank you. And what I'd like to add to what my colleagues have already said is in terms of allyship is not about asking for greater punishment. It's actually about asking for a collective accountability, mm -hmm. such that the accountability falls on all of us. 
because as we think about mental health in this moment, we are all traumatized. However, that trauma has not been evenly distributed and falls along distinct racial and ethnic lines. So to highlight what Professor Vuki and Professor Ray have been saying, in that moment when I was being chased down the street with the threat of physical violence, I did not want anyone to be punished. What I really feared in that moment was not being hit in the face. What I feared was that no one around me was going to do anything about it. And I could no longer trust the community to be, hold other people accountable, right? The social contract of being a community had no longer felt like it was in place. And that's the real problem here that we're speaking to. It's not about individualized acts, it's about coming together. Absolutely. I think we're all touching upon this concept of, of allyship. And I think what goes um, along with that is who carries, who carries the burden to educate, to change, to uh, make a difference. And with recent events, with the horrific death of George Floyd, you have um, this surge of, um, for a lack of a better term, white awareness on what's you know, really happening. Um, and, you know, I see even in my social media feeds, um, you know, people um, uh, that, that, I, that identify as white, you know, um, coming to an understanding of, you know, what can I do? This is horrific. And, and some even asking, you know, why, um, why did it take so long for us to wake up now? You know, and we're waking up now, and and the you know yes, that's you know the surge and the awareness is is uh, will certainly help, but there's still folks that are not awake that that are that need to realize that the burden does not lie on the marginalized populations to ch make this change. It really it's systemic it it lies with those who hold the privilege and even within the identities as we've talked about there might be folks that hold more privilege than others so how do you whether it's um, and not necessarily privilege of skin color but privilege of access to resources privilege of you know where you can, uh, are in certain um, societies or access to um, uh, different um, financial uh, abilities um, or resources just period, resources, and thinking about allyship, we've seen um, it range from, of course, uh, social media stands, uh, which are powerful in that they are viral and that they, uh, that they feel supportive, but it really, when it comes down to sometimes those moments, is trusting that they're, they're there. Um, and so, um, when we think of ally strategies, um, and we are all, of course, you know, educators of uh, people of color, what is the ask of an ally at this point? I guess that, oh, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so as you're talking, I think this idea, and I think it was mentioned uh, the other examples, is ask of an allyship, but really you're talking about a bystander. So we had that bystander, that you're talking about bystander effect too, is like someone else we're going to do, or, or you expect someone else to step up. And so I think um, that as an ally, and for us as well, I mean, we're allies for other groups as well, it's just for everyone has accountability and responsibility, is that make yourself known. If you see something, then make sure just say, hey, or, you know, extract that person out from it. Say, do you need help? Can you, can I come, can you come with me, help me? Um, whatever it is, but don't stay silent. We're asking for people just to stand up. Even if it's just say, whatever it is, just say, stop it. Just anything. You don't have to confront the person, but please speak up and say, this is not okay, right? Um, as so I keep thinking as you're talking about this whole bystander effect, as up from psychology, social, social, um, it is, everyone just wants to say, well, it's someone else's problem. Someone else will, t will take it up, not me. But this is not the time anymore. It's, it's, everyone's, um, it's everyone's job right now. I was just going to say uh, that uh, I think we, uh, at least we panelists, at some level have the privilege. Privilege comes with social responsibility. That's my mantra. Um, it's not just enjoying the privilege. What can I offer? 
so that I can model good behavior for people, young people, my colleagues. Um, and I guess that I would say giving space for both parties. Sometimes allies say, I have to say that sometimes I get overwhelmed when my white allies are constantly asking, what can I do? I think we have to have a moderation. You know, jumping into help, to me, that rescue mentality sometimes backfires. You have to have space for people to receive and to give. That's just my own thing. Um, the other thing is that there is, there is a level of awareness. And like Dr. Vuki mentioned, some people kind of stay away. Some people engage in dialogue. I think if you look at Janet Helm, who is the uh, professor at uh, Boston College, has talked about uh, racial identity model. Not all of us are at the same level of awareness or insight. Depending on where we stand, depending on our own insight about our own identity and others, the dialogue has to happen in that way. I guess that some people are not ready. I constantly do lab meetings every week. Actually, I'm doing one tomorrow with a larger collaborative lab meeting because students are getting frustrated both ends. Some students of color are saying they are not hearing us. They want to lead, but when are we going to have a voice? So that is one thing. The other allyship is that some white students are very afraid, not just students, white colleagues, white uh, community members, no matter what I say, I will be blamed. So in a way, we just have to co-create depending on level of awareness and intentionality. If the intention is there, not jumping into, but asking for space. So that's all I would say at this point. What I have once again built upon the incredible insights of Professor Vuki and Professor Ray uh, in terms of bystandership. So in the model of bystander intervention that we have, it's about individuals jumping in to do something. That's important. And we also need to frame it through this lens of helping each other out and building together. Right. So in this moment, as we think about the social media response to the current 2020 movement for Black Lives, there on the one hand, is a lot of what people call performative allyship of very, very loudly wanting congratulations for becoming aware of issues that people have known about for a long time. So an important part of being a bystander is not expecting to be the hero of the situation, but doing it because it's something that is just and something that benefits everyone to take the privilege that you have or to take the feeling of protection and risk it on behalf of another person. I was having a conversation with my best friend last night about this conversation on COVID xenophobia. She's a mental health professional and she and her organization have a lot of conversations about viewing the pandemic and all of its manifestations through the lens of trauma. So instead of thinking about this individual harm, thinking about this larger event that's happening and the way that people are being impacted by that in ways that cannot just be individualized or personalized. And and so thinking through the lens of trauma requires focusing compassion forward, right? So instead of centering your own feelings in this moment. So for example, if you don't identify as Black or African American, and if you don't identify as Asian or Asian American, no longer having the knee-jerk response of this is 2020, because as we've seen, we are not neither progressing nor regressing. Racism and xenophobia in America has always been this way. It, it's just that now you're being invited into seeing it. So, as Professor Ray was saying, I too am tired of being your token explainer of things that are happening, because as we shared earlier, there are many intellectuals, artists, and activists who have made this information widely available. So, one thing you can do is become educated yourself and really think about these questions that you have and know that there are resources out there that want to help. In the most immediate sense, there's bystander intervention training happening on Zoom to really equip you with the information and tactics that you need as this thing that you can do in this moment. So as my best friend says, check your response and don't ask someone who's directly affected to change their response. 
So I'd like to add to that. This is like a very enriching conversation. So again, as things are being said, it's like, oh, I, um, so I think, Gloria, we were talking about in our uh, WJC too, is that having these, having the, everyone, every professor, everyone having accountability to have these difficult conversations, whether within staff, faculty, or within students. So I, they, again, with the bystander intervention training, there are, inf there's guides out there as well about having these difficult conversations being vulnerable, taking risks or saying, I, I, I don't know what to do, or I don't know what to say, you know, so I think we all have to start having these conversations and not hide away, right? And so I think I like what you said, it's like, um, educate yourself, do your, do your homework first before you go and ask of someone else to do it for you. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And sorry, one thing I'd like to add is Thinking about this moment in particular, we talked about the role of social media. We've talked about people who feel like they're not impacted but want to do something. There's a lot of lines being drawn about us and them. Yeah. And it may not be the same us and them as xenophobia, but there is this way we're talking about a them, a them like Black communities organizing or, and their allies, or a them of Asian and Asian Americans who are increasingly reporting moments of bias incidents and hate crimes that are not being in any way followed up on. There's a lot of them happening. And I want us to reimagine what us and them can mean in this moment if we thought of a larger us, where the us also doesn't colonize the experience of those who are directly impacted. So thinking about empathy as a mode of healing. Yep. Absolutely. That's great. Thank thank you so much for 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 sharing. It 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 is. It um when you try to organize and you you try and build, um, you, you find yourself sometimes, you know, in a, in a similar circle of you know creating in group out group effect. And I think that's that's so critical to always sort of keep in mind as in what is what is the outcome, what is the greater good that we're trying to achieve here, um, and in this this impact and change and and the stop of the hate um, as professionals in higher education um, who knows what is awaiting all of us as we are you know start beginning to close out the summer and uh, fall begins to reopen but whether it be through remote classes or in vivo classes we are going to have a responsibility, uh, and that is our privilege, that is our voice as educators. We're going to have a responsibility to uh, teach and educate in a different way with uh, all that's happened. And we are going to have to think about those potential difficult dialogues that are going to happen in the classroom, within the ins and outs of the groups that exist and with all the different identities. Um, and in the past, we've seen how to impact um, those uh, situations of conflict. But I think there's an understanding that there's a greater awareness of it present now, and there's a greater um, uh, need for it. So I'd like to go around um, as we sort of go draw our close um, on this blog to think about st strategies as higher ed professionals, as professors in the classroom. Uh, maybe uh, what to expect and, and, and just thoughts and ideas on, on what to do in, in spaces of, in, in those spaces. Um, I'll just go uh, because I, I am now planning for my project. There are three things I have planned. First of all, checking my own implicit bias. I guess that if we as educators do not acknowledge our own biases when the difficult dialogue happens in the classroom with diverse students group, I have caught myself sometime getting defensive. I think that's my summer project to <laughs> address how not to be defensive. We are, we are all work in progress. I am part of that work in progress. So that is number one that comes from me and how to become a good role model in the classroom in engaging in difficult dialogue to give space for people 
to hear them. As you know, in George Floyd's protest march, the one thing that is said, hear us. I think once we listen, half the problem is gone. And the third thing that I'm planning to do, I'm creating targeted project that students will do in a team to engage in some of the empowerment and community health project. So these are the things I'm planning and I'm collecting a lot of literature which I never shared before that they have to read about history, about how to be uh, good allies. Thanks, Dr. Ray. So I can share. So I'm teaching a summer course right now and um, online. And I think, and then like you said, like within a month, everything, it was just, every day there's something new. So again, we can't ignore, we have to address it. So um, I think for myself, along with what you said, Sakonya, it was like implicit bias, like checking myself, because you know we're human, we have emotions, we're impacted. Um, and so what I did with my class is that I had my lesson plan, but I just said, and I said, we need to talk about this and we have space. And I started with myself how I was feeling, because again, I think students need to hear that professors also struggle and whatever it is that they're going through. And I said, I'm in clinic. I hear the stories in and out. Um, and so I think this last, this last week I did that. And I was, I was, I had to say, I came, I didn't want to teach my lesson plan. I was like, why is this important right now? But, but we did, we set it aside and we, then we broke out in breakout rooms. So they're smaller because I think with a large class, it's hard to share. So as I entered each breakout room, they were really talking about their fears or their, uh, you know, unknowns. Um, and I also, and I, and so they thanked me for doing that, saying that, thank you for acknowledging this is a stressful time. Thank you for acknowledging that we all can be afraid and it's okay that we'll, we can, you know, uh, go through this together and move forward. And so that's what I'm going to plan to do is check in with them. Yes, we have to teach. Yes, we have to learn our material, but we also need to, as ourselves as mental health, we need to check in and support each other. I mean, there's a lot of materials out there for teaching tolerance. I think we, we can't assume that we know we're the perfect teacher and we know what we're doing. I, we need to also continue, um, keeping up to date with what what the, the the best practices are for to teach to our students as you said Sakonya, there's so many students coming with diverse backgrounds trauma and we really need to be able to be, be able to support them as well and really just to build on what professor ray and professor Vuki have said it's important i think the important thing going back into the classroom is really to recentralize that the classroom is a space of power just like fundamentally in the teacher student relationship we can be humane about it we can show up as a full person but also we do have power over that space so as professor Vuki had talked about in terms of intervention strategies it actually is our responsibility to use that power wisely if a student is spreading misinformation that clearly is related to prejudice and bias it actually is part of the job to mediate that conversation but then also as professor ray has mentioned even as we can use our classes to take this moment to really explore the depth of mental health and how it's refracted through the different communities and identities we belong to, it's our responsibility not to do this ethically and responsibly and not re-traumatize our students. So if we're doing a research activity around COVID, it is not the Asian American and Asian students job to explain to the rest of the class the impact that they've experienced. In the same way, of if we're talking about the summer of the movement for Black Lives, it is not the Black students' responsibility to explain their trauma to everyone, because that's an irresponsible use of that power. Instead, it's about having this type of social engagement, because to avoid these issues is not being politically neutral. It's itself a political move to try to avoid what's happening. We have to build this bridge between what's happening and understanding the power that we have inside the classroom to shape people's perspectives and reshape towards a better world. But also we can do all the terrible things that we've been talking about throughout this Zoom session if we're not careful. So really becoming informed as educators before we go in with the best intentions. And um, I would just say, Gloria, that we have model examples coming from great leaders. So I am right now compiling a lot of narratives, quotes, inspirational ones 
to be part of my lesson plan. And uh, I sent it to you, Gloria, because uh, this is a time we don't know all the answers, but our leaders who are transformative leaders, educators, we can refer. That to me is a beautiful resource for yes. us. And so much, Sakanya, and I'll share those um, as we as we close out our our conversation today. Um, and and I want to thank you all uh, for for all your thoughts and all your ideas and and all your um, your uh, research and, and and pedagogy in this space. It's so needed. We think about even uh, the classroom itself and the dynamic of uh, the professor and the student and that power dynamic that exists. And um, I am reminded sometimes of um, the vulnerability that we have to put ourselves in um, as the educator um, to be able to uh, pause and actually walk a journey so that students feel then the space to then share um, or to own our biases, whatever they might be, um, in, the, in the right off the get-go, so that that space is created, that there is no, um, you know, yes, you might be a content specialist in this area, but in terms of our learning, we are doing this together. Um, and so I, I thank you all very much. And, and you know we we say many times that um, our journeys as as people of color is is we we walk on the shoulders of those that are greater than us, and so uh, I I open it now. We'll open with Sukanya's quotes that she shared via PowerPoint, and then I'll turn it back to the screen, and we'll we'll share some um, some final. Thank you, Gloria. This is a great way to connect with colleagues, like-minded colleagues. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so here we go. Let's see some. So final reflection, Sukhani, would you like to share um, this slide? I mean, these are my uh, personal model, role model, um, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, quotes. I always go back to be the change you are trying to create. That's a powerful thing for me. And he talked about our greatest ability as humans is not to change the world, but to change ourselves. And Mother Teresa uh, is known for her compassion and love and inclusivity, which kind of aligns with our uh, panel today. She talked about two things. If we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And second, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Those are beautiful quotes by some very powerful and uh, impactful uh, leaders um, in community, in our communities. Um, Final thoughts at this point before we close. Uh, thank you so much for all of you being here. This has been fantastic. Um, and an ability to share um, your voices for others to hear. I'll open it up for final thoughts. I mean, really just to build upon what we've been discussing this entire time is thinking about the interconnections of our struggles, not only as individuals, but also as members of communities that are also living in this moment of great distress and trauma. So, I mean, the parting wisdom that I have is coming from the demonstrations, protests, and actions that have been taking place throughout the week prior to this recording of thinking about how none of us are free until we all get free. Thanks, Dr. Rishi. Dr. Buki, final thoughts? I think that she said it perfectly. <laughs> that was beautiful. That should be the ending. <laughs> um, I think, again, we've been planning and some plans. Again, I'm just so overwhelmed by just how much has changed within a month, within a week. Um, I have to say that I am, um, I've been in many conversations with many different people. So I think I'm, I'm, it's, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that unfortunately from this, tra from these tragedies, from the, the, the hatred that's come out, it really truly has sparked dialogue. 
Um, and I think part of it is like the pandemic, people have been shut in for 10 weeks. Now they're really, so I don't know if it's part of pandemic or part of what's happening, but people are dialoguing and it's across all groups. And so I think that's what I'm hopeful about um, that, in, that as we progress, that, that there will be change. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would just say that our own compassion must also be at the forefront of our action. So we have to hold both things together, action and compassion. Well, thank you all uh, for your time today. And we will be uh, sharing this out with uh, our communities. And as soon as I, I have a link, we'll, <laughs> we'll be able to share um, this um, piece of information and uh, voice and community out to to all folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.